Section One of The Eyes of the Movie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chuck Williamson. The Eyes of the Movie by Harry Allen Potemkin. The movie was born in the laboratory and reared in the counting house. It is a benevolent monster of four eyes. Inventor, investor, impresario, imperialist. The second and fourth eyes are the guiding ones. They pilot the course of the motion picture. The course is so piloted that it is favorable to the equilibrium of the ruling class and unfavorable to the working class. This is truer in the realm of the film than in the other arts, for the film more than the other arts is the art of the people. As far back as 1910, a commentator recognized the movie as the entertainment of, quote, the self-respecting petty bourgeoisie and the working class." End quote. In 1916, D. W. Griffith, pioneer director of the film, called the movie, quote, the laboring man's university, End quote. In 1925, a well-known American writer called it, quote, the laborer's art, End quote. The commentator of 1910, a Harvard philosopher, asked for a motion picture that would solve all problems for the audience in melodramas of right victories over wrong. <laughs> in short, hokum. Because, quote, there is no truth in the superstition that it is good for the public to think. End quote. He wanted social stability, and that is what the makers of the movie want today, even though social stability means social stagnation. The owners of this art industry insist that their merchandise is mere entertainment, passing amusement. They point the finger of reproach to the Soviet film which is straightforward propaganda, the urging of a positive and persuasive idea. Now, the movie is, for the great majority of people, the art to which they most impressionably respond. That has been admitted, as quoted in the first paragraph, and by the evidence of the movie's popularity. Most people are eye-minded. The things their eyes see become the things that affect them. The suggestion of the movie, because they are given in active dramatic images that seem real, with recognizable persons in recognizable settings, and because they are repeated in film after film, become the beliefs of the impressionable audience, whose mind receives the suggestions like wax and retains them like marble. The movie is the modern ritual, and though its invitation, its benevolence, is entertainment, its influence is propaganda. The owners of the movie industry know that the movie is entertainment as propaganda in behalf of their class. Statesmen, churchmen, and others serving capitalism have been aware of the effectiveness of the movie for reactionary propaganda ever since the art was invented. As far back as 1902, when the movie was just creeping out of the Penny Arcade peep show stage, England was already talking about the Americanization of the world in which process the movie was assigned an important part. Mention was made of how alert the missionaries were to the possibility of the kinetograph as propaganda for Christianity. 
by 1911, the very elite London journal, Country Life, in an editorial wrote that the kinetograph in England, quote, soon became utilized for propagandistic work. Missionary meetings were enlivened by moving pictures of the heathen in their blindness, bowing down to wood and stone. We see, however, that this same journal in the same editorial gets excited against the film propaganda of another country, that of the United States. The movie is the climax to the impressions of other forms of propaganda, school, church, press. And since these are controlled by the same class controlling the movie, the spectator is influenced by one driving class propaganda implanted in his mind by the decisive impression made by the film. Direct tie-ups of magazines with motion pictures go back to 1912, when the Edison serial film, What Happened to Mary, ran in the McClure magazine, The Ladies' World. Since then, the newspaper, the magazine, and the published book have worked hand-in-hand hand with the film. We find a capitalist like Hearst, powerful in press, film, and radio. Footnote. His outlets being Hearst Metrotone News, produced by Fox Film Corps and distributed by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Cosmopolitan Productions, released and distributed by MGM. Hearst specializes in making films for Marion Davies and in the so-called political films. The notorious Gabriel over the White House, which was serialized in the Hearst Press simultaneously with its public release. And Washington Masquerade, for instance. End footnote. The printed word helps to create the atmosphere of romance around the personalities of the players the moviegoer sees on the screen. A glamorous priesthood lures the laity and tells them all about life. And since that other great industrialized art, the radio, is joined with the movie, the impression is made even stronger. The sound film has made the movie seem more real. And television, because it will pretend to come direct and untouched from the source, will add to the effectiveness of the propaganda. To indicate the relative strength of the movie, I quote from a teacher who overheard two of her high school pupils discuss the merits of Joseph Hergsheimer's novel, Java Head. Quote, one of the girls had read the book, the other had seen the film based on the story. The first referred to the Manchu woman as having given her new light in her conception of the Chinese. But, said her friend, you should have seen her in the movies. She was just like all the rest of them. It was all right to read about them, but I don't like to see them. End quote. This is the medium that is in the hands of high finance. The independent producer hasn't a chance except to stick close to the average merchandise. The independent producer is being pushed out speedily. He is now negligible. And the independent producer is not independent in conscience or courage. He makes horse operas, cowboy pictures, fake Africans, cheap sex rot to edge into a controlled market. By 1917, the popular serial actor and director J.P. McGowan, writing in a little red highbrow magazine, could say, quote, The day is past when small capital, coupled with boundless presumption, is capable of creating a millionaire overnight. Daily it is becoming more substantially commercialized, which is but another way of saying the conservative element is coming into the ascendant. End quote. It would seem that today, with the movie industry at low ebb, an independent might risk a film of more honest subject matter. But the producer, 
the so-called independent as well as the movie trust is part of the conservative element the middle class that is becoming more and more self-protective only one independent can offer the necessary challenge militant labor a glance at the composition of this conservative element is enlightening first there is the producer who is also dominantly the distributor and the exhibitor the three-in-one producer is a former small merchant a manufacturer a gambler or the like under financial hegemony then there is the director and those pertaining to him the scenarist the cameraman etc the director et al are seldom near the social experience the economic life of the audience who is to be reached and touched the actor is usually a conceited glorified upstart without experience or an actor whose experience in life is framed rigidly by the proscenium arch or the perimeter of the silver screen together they express the nouveau riche and gross aspirations of the conservative element and it is the actor who especially colors the film since he is the golden trademark of the movie merchandise altogether they are concentrated in hollywood a circle of vested interests whose circumference does not go beyond the perimeter of the screen for a knowledge of life in nineteen fourteen an independent producer might possibly risk a film sympathizing with the plight of labor in that year upton sinclair's novel the jungle was made into a movie the company that produced it was permitted to go bankrupt we must not forget also that the jungle has been persistently read down by the middle class as a tract for pure food and the middle class has an interest in that in the very same year jesse lasky always a leader in the reactionary film produced the other son a film vindicating the strike-breaker and condemning the labor agitator upton sinclair sold two other stories to the movies one was an unpublished play afterwards the plot within a plot of the pot boilers this was turned into a story of a lost will having nothing to do with the original sinclair's novel the money changers which describes j p morgan as causing the panic of nineteen o seven was sold to a personal friend ben hampton who bought it with the promise of respecting both letter and spirit it appeared as a melodrama of chinese dope traffic sinclair sought to prevent the use of his name but pathe had the contracts and ideas and names are merchandise in the courts of law if the idea is the money changers and the name is upton sinclair footnote ben hampton doesn't mention the incident in his history of the movies 1931 in 1933 upton sinclair steps into ben hampton's shoes and refuses to eliminate eisenstein's name from the distorted version of que viva mexico made by upton sinclair and saul lesser see new masses september 1933 for elaboration on this point end footnote we have another instance in the case of an american tragedy every year sinclair gets an offer to picturize one of his stories if he'll leave out the socialism and socialism implies to the american producer anything that might remotely favor the viewpoint of labor in the little church around the corner the movie definitely asks labor to believe in the boss through the church the scene is set in a mining town 
an orphan lad whose father has been killed in the mine has an itch for holiness but he is derided by the villainous boy because he can't effect a miracle on a mute girl the operator persuaded by his young daughter takes the young and frustrated saint under his wing the boy becomes a clergyman a delegation of miners calls on the operator demanding safer working conditions the hard-hearted boss refuses to listen since it is only a question of the heart a way must be found to soften that organ the clergyman goes back to his people a cave-in takes place the clergyman digs in and rescues the entombed men the church you see is the savior of labor but the workers want revenge on the boss what cries the young minister would you use violence now really the mute girl grown older and dumber stands near him he prays she prays the lips move my god she speaks a miracle the mute girl speaks and the boss sees the light the men too they are convinced the boss's hard heart is as soft as a woman's now all is honky tonky or is it honky dory and hotsy totsy capital and labor embrace to strengthen the religious appeal the doughnut damsel of the essay salvation army stands by to help the war isn't over yet but today the theme of capital and labor is carefully avoided the laborer is either a clown or a romantic swashbuckler who gets the girl should a riveter fall in love with an heiress another gay racketeer hero in this way labor is cajoled and flattered and diverted from the fact at hand the fact of struggle in the farcical comedy it is usually one of the lower classes who is the buffoon he is a goof a nut a classic hobo a christian innocent who however most often like the valiant little tailor wins by the accident of wit at the lucky moment of course the successful class cannot admit its success is purely luck it is wit turning accidents into account so that in effect luck isn't luck at all dominance is due entirely to the divine right of quick thinking inspired by the devotion of a pure maiden the negro gets special jim crow treatment he is not new to the american film long ago bert williams appeared in the movie before the war Sigmund Lubin produced all Negro farces in Philadelphia. They portrayed the Negroes as indolent idiots. It was the film of the Jeffries Johnson fight in which the Negro pugilist won that thrust the Negro out of the movie. The battle took place on July 4th, 1910, and was the climax to the bitter racial sentiment that followed upon the panic of 1907 the southern bosses had seized the opportunity and intensified the breach in the working class as a way of deflecting the class attack a typical strategy there was the atlanta railway men's race war in the popular theater announcement had to be made on the showing of uncle tom's cabin that a completely white cast was playing the negro roles it is only very recently that this perennial has been filmed with negroes and then in a genial manner hardly indicting the white masters of today end of section one
Section Two of The Eyes of the Movie by Harry Allen Potemkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Negro. There have been films with so called Negro themes. Years ago, there was Edward Sheldon's play, The Nigger, filmed as The Governor pretending to be charitable sentiments toward the negro it was actually an attack on miscegenation intermarriage america's greatest director david wark griffith son of a confederate officer gave us the birth of a nation from the reverend thomas dixon's the klansman which has served in book and film as the bible of the ku klux klan the rise of the twentieth century clan was inspired by the revival of the picture and today when race feeling is so acute in the south the film is again revived to circulate in provincial towns as well as cities when objection was raised by negroes and whites to this film griffith behind the barrage of free speech issued a pamphlet and a film upon intolerance he quoted the press north and south in defense of tolerance the houston texas chronicle said quote, the time has not come when the people of houston are to have their standards of thought or taste set or fixed or regulated by the negro citizenship End quote the negro is treated in the film as an amusement a clown who sings all the time dances shoots crap and men is dissolute wields a razor etc he is the butt even films with children like the hal roach r gang comedies make the negro child farina the receiver of the blows this has a double insidiousness it abuses the negro and it falsifies childhood relationships if white children accept a negro child in their play as our gang accepts farina then the negro is accepted on equal terms or not at all children are not naturally race bigoted such sentiment is instilled by adults who are themselves within the influence of a class society the southern upper class doesn't want even that much mingling when the czar of the movies will hayes sent out feelers to the press l f hart reviewer for the fort worth texas star wrote that he quote, would protest promiscuous mingling of the races in such pictures as Hal Roach comedies, as Texas has Jim Crow statutes, and intermarriage of whites and blacks is punishable as miscegenation. End quote. Griffith introduced another racial film, his one exciting night, the parent of mystery farces as a negro was the scary william of the haunted house but since a part is a featured one griffith's southern tolerance cannot accept an authentic negro he blackfaces tom wilson a white man for the role adding insult to injury in his recent film lincoln our director employs negroes in a roxy setting but keeps them remotely in the background hallelujah pretended to be a sincere picture of the agricultural negro but it was another review film with all the trappings of the legendary negro as white men like to see him he is held to blame for his own sorrows he is his own nemesis with the devil in him the white exploiter is completely absolved when the film was shown in new york the negro audience was segregated in a harlem theater to keep them in their place the whites saw the film on broadway 
the great white way the southern upper crust objected to hallelujah they did not like this relation of the negro as star and themselves as customers the negro was not ridiculous enough no aim as an andy a little too romantic for the southern boss worried by signs of working-class solidarity it must be noticed that the film took care to avoid negroes too emphatically black they had to serve yaller negroes to the sexual pander of the white audience and to the dignity of the negro upper class no objection was raised by the negro upper class to hallelujah as was raised to the birth of a nation the former did not offend the class dignity of the negro elite it was so elemental you know although it falsified the negro tenant farmer to make the negro ridiculous he is put into all sorts of situations that are out of keeping with a particular film a documentation of a polar voyage intrudes a negro to be frightened by a bear tightly bound the animated cartoon contains black animals personified invidiously the newsreels have shown negro boys in battle royales and grease pole fights degrading sports for the amusement of the guffawing tammany clown al smith they have relished the demonstration of frenzied baptisms which are as common certainly among the southern whites as among the blacks but white baptisms are not shown on the screen negroes have produced films with negroes as actors these duplicate white productions they avoid the real life of the negro they do not dare to criticize the society that produces racial antagonism because that would mean issuing films on the life of the negro worker as a worker the jew the jew has had special treatment too he too has been a clown or a sentimentalized scarecrow in 1912 the american solax company in advertising their film a man's man said quote, up to very recently the stage jew was the only type which furnished universal amusement long whiskers derby hat down to the ears and hands moving like the fins of a fish his manhood his sentiments and his convictions are not burlesqued that is not in this film a man's man but are idealized End quote. the reliance company produced solomon's son so their notice read Quote, with dignity minus the burlesque atmosphere usually attending the gentiles version of a jewish story End quote. so that between the comic jew and the idealized jew there are no gradations to find the real jew we must turn to the soviet film footnote the Jew and the Jewish problem has been dealt with in such Soviet films as Cain and Artem, A Jew at War, Horizon, and The Return of Nathan Becker, the first Soviet sound film in the Yiddish language. End footnote. We hear no objection to this distortion of the Jew, but when the shoddy film The King of Kings appears, Jewish upper-class dignity is offended by the portrayal of historic biblical characters and what a lamentation is heard to these silk hat Jews Cecil DeMille the director replies beating his breast would I insult the Jews I'm half Jew myself 
and so we get the negro on the half shell the jew on the half shell the worker on the half shell as an appetizer for middle-class attitudes in the meantime the film of angel political decoy of the american art will hayes in his ambitious code of the motion picture producers and distributors of america incorporated says that quote, the history institutions prominent people and citizenry of other nations shall be represented fairly End quote. not the foreigner or foreign-born worker in america god and wall street for fend but only the prominent people are to be treated with courtesy people like the ex-grand duke still called by his title a siamese king a prince of japan the prince of wales anyone high hat enough the newsreel and dramatic picture present him as superfine merchandise the swede prisoner in the big house devours all the prison swill that even the moral moron the american machine-gun murderer butch revolts against give the public what it wants you see we need the swell folk the movie business believes in give the public what it wants which means give the public what we want the public to want by we in this reference i mean the dominant class the oppressive stratum wants the public to react away from certain prejudices they have been dealt with in this pamphlet up to now and it wants the public to act towards certain illusions vicarious experiences distractions glamorous falsehoods the problem that may be faced is that of the restless rich the love irritations of those who are born to the purple the audiences served these films on polished platters of experiences of witty folk so lucky to have such tremulous heartaches and such easy access to liquor the agonies of the social register the blue book blues the audience feels the thrill of escape from the major problem of reality into a life of fancy which appears real repeated succession of such films makes the audience the self-respecting petty bourgeoisie and the working class forgetful of their plight that at least is the hope of the class serving this dish as more and more doubt creeps into the audience through the pressure of circumstance and positive radical education the illusion served will be augmented to overwhelm dissent the nouveau riche the ideas of the nouveau riche are constantly fed the lower class audience distance and time place and experience is offered as enchantment there is the thriller the carelessness of the slapstick the boulevardier comedy of an adolf minju the comedy of the glistening high hat there is approximate rape the thrill of it and compensation rape with virginity preserved there is the final kiss the happy ending and even the unhappy ending has its compensation arbitrary redemption the acquittal of social institutions or the tears of solace there is the princess and the serving man the prince and the serving maid motif the cat may look at a queen she got her man there is the good bad man rural in the wild west film cosmopolitan in the racketeer picture the bluffs at exposing racketeering merely hide its basis in our competitive society there is the picture glorifying the magnate as human george arliss and the millionaire 
there's no lace on his underwear the one picture on the life of a living american is prepared on john d rockefeller senior it is to be called by the name of the paragon himself and he has okayed the scenario it is announced on the occasion of the capitalist's ninety-second birthday anniversary when the country's press spends its talents in eulogy and john d jr writes to one newspaper saying how gratifying it is to know that though quote, two or three decades ago he john d senior was being bitterly assailed for the alleged predatory tactics of the great oil company with which he was identified since that time sentiment toward him appears to have undergone a radical change End quote. a reactionary change the process of bourgeois society is one of vindication and how well the movie serves it while the press and the pictures pretend to go thumbs down on racketeering urging the secret six the vigilantes to get after the gangster pathé has even its newsreels serve in this racket the racketeer par excellence is deified a number of these self-defense films pretend to be social criticism we get epic subjects like the trail of ninety eight the covered wagon and cimarron reduced into films that are narratives of attempted rape and the eternal triangle personal enmity and personal vanity we get prison films like the big house that shift the social guilt from society to the individual and from the individual to nowhere we get an american tragedy that debases a criticism of society to a justification of its vicious process by having justice redeemed a tragic social document becomes a duplicate murder story and the court says quote, that's fine the people want to see justice prevail rather than the inevitability of a social process End quote. End of section two. Section three of The Eyes of the Movie by Harry Allen Potemkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. War Films and we have the war films the film has served the war from its infancy the american movie had its start in the spanish-american war romania used pictures of her troops in the balkan war to stir enthusiasm for the world war and japan did the same with pictures of the russo-japanese war in 1915 when we were ostensibly neutral films like the trees of anatole were produced sympathizing with french and german soldiery but making of war a wistful attraction that year england perpetrated films with a dual purpose to stimulate enlistment and to encourage anglophile sentiment in america an english producer said to an american journalist at that time quote, our days and nights too are spent in glorifying the british and showing the germans up in an unfortunate light american exhibitors have no desire to violate uncle sam's admirable desire to be neutral End quote. the tone as well as sequence is ironical fooling the fatherland became for american consumption a foreign power outwitted quote, the explanatory matter of the play is to be so altered that it mentions either a nameless or fictitious power at war with britain End quote. but quote, 
for all our scheming we fail to cover up the fact that the enemy wear german uniforms and a doctored photoplay may always be detected by others End quote. in september 1915 hudson maxim's preparedness tract defenseless peace was filmed as the battle cry of peace ford attacked the picture in full page newspaper ads quote, he pointed out that maxim munitions corporation stock was on the market end quote. thomas ince served the quasi pacifistic dish civilization which strengthened wilson's campaign on the kept us out of the war ticket the dubious pacifism of america produced war brides provoked by the acuteness of feminism at that moment it told quote, how a woman driven to desperation by the loss of loved ones defied an empire End quote. its romantic futility satisfied the uncritical pacifism that subscribed to and was betrayed by the Woodrowian slogans, too proud to fight, watchful waiting, he kept us out of the war. How simple it was to convert these into one glamorous, make the world safe for democracy. War brides was suppressed. The suppression was justified thus. Quote, the philosophy of this picture is so easily misunderstood by unthinking people that it has been found necessary to withdraw it from circulation for the duration of the war. End quote. Hearst, more interested in Mexico and Japan than in Europe, took the serial The Last of the Cannings, glorifying the DuPont family and American womanhood and converted it into patria an attack on hearst's phobias we were not yet at war with germany but close to it and japan was an ally of britain an enemy of germany woodrow wilson asked that the anti-japanese touches be removed the japanese flag was lifted out and by contiguity the mexican too Preparations for the war objector were part of the preparedness propaganda. In the last months of 1916, the slacker told of the conversion of a society butterfly into a flag sycophant. It should be indicated also that the soldiers in war brides, against whom Alan Azimov rose, were out and out German. Films appeared, romanticizing British history and espionage. The Victoria Cross, The English in India, Shell 34, The Heroism of a Spy, An Enemy of the King, The Days of Henry of Navarre. In 1914, the outdoor war news film showings of the New York Herald brought counter applause from allied and untaunt sympathizers. Quote, we were neutral with a vengeance in those days. End quote. Germany tried to edge in for sympathy with behind the German lines, but the interests were concentrating popular interest upon the allies and pro-British, pro-French films appeared. Geraldine Ferrer played in Joan the Woman, a Lasky picture. Pictures of our troops in Mexico and the war abroad had served to create an ennui for battle. The yearning was there, at first weak and confused, but steadily strengthened into violence by suggestion and direct hypodermic. The rape of Belgium was perpetrated in the studios of America, abetted by our allies. The uninterrupted propaganda turned America about face, seemingly overnight. Actually, 
this propaganda had been increasing at work ascending toward a climax and america had turned quarter bout half about until full about facing the entente squarely the need was to create and sustain a war temper to eliminate all doubts and to extract devotion moral and material the impressionable director set to the ins producers of civilization emitted viva la france slogan films were plentiful over there to hell with the kaiser for france lest we forget love for our brothers in arms was instilled by films domestic and imported such as the belgian daughter of france sarah bernhardt in mothers of france somewhere in france hearts of the world d w griffith's contribution to the barrage the strifes of france were presented to america birth of democracy french revolution and the bugler of algiers eighteen seventy the vestiges of admiration for germany were eliminated by films like the kaiser beast of berlin the prussian cur the hun within german-american support was bid for in mary pickford's the little american a tragic comedy describing quote, the german cavalry of bestiality the hellhounds and the repentant kaiser man End quote. Chaplin ridiculed the Kaiser in Shoulder Arms. The fair sex was intrigued by films like Joan of Plattsburgh. As far back as 1916, quote, when everybody but the public knew we were going into the big fight overseas, end quote. A glittering Joan on a white horse, contributed by the movie people, had paraded in the suffrage march on Fifth Avenue. The movie stars, like Mary Pickford and Dorothy Dalton, became the symbolic Jones of American divisions in the war. A miniature Joan, Baby Peggy, joined the abominable harangue that children spat on fathers of families. Don't be a slacker. An insidious propaganda among children was instituted and developed. The non-military Boy Scouts had films made especially for them. Pershing's Crusaders, The Star-Spangled Banner, The War Waif, Your Flag and My Flag, serials like The English Boy Scouts to the Rescue, and Ten Adventures of a Boy Scout. The objector was shamed by Don't Bite the Hand That's Feeding You movies. My own United States. A call to arms, the son of democracy. The man without a country. Draft 258. The unbeliever. The great love. One more American. The man who was afraid. German atrocities were insisted upon the woman the german shot all branches of the service were gilded the hero of submarine d2 governmental organization found incentive in conjunction with england citizen bodies and the film corporations an american cinema commission went abroad england had organized one with eminent individuals like Conan Doyle. D. W. Griffith not only was at work in England on Hearts of the World, but he also cooperated with high society in recruiting British sentiment. The National Association of the Motion Picture Industry, William A. Brady, President, was organized but never functioned, although it served as a stimulant to the movie company's enthusiasm. The Red Cross had begun to use films, but not satisfactorily enough. With Creel's Committee on Public Information, the Red Cross set up 
the division of pictures which released four films to one-third of the movie houses quote about the same number of audiences as chaplin audiences end quote in new york there was the mayor's committee of national defense jesse l lasky motion picture chairman the movie companies organized a war cooperative council in 1918 the films were said to have put about 100 million dollars into the war chest movie stars spoke and carried on for the red cross the liberty loan and enlistment a propaganda slide in the cinemas read quote, if you are an american you should be proud to say so End quote. the sale of liberty loan bonds was helped by seventy thousand slides and chaplin sold autographed halves of his hat the movie actors joined the california coast artillery others organized the lasky home guards lasky received a title for his work in many divisions his cooperation with the government was balanced after the war by the government's willingness to help in the aviation film wings the popular star robert warwick now a captain was quoted in the fan press upon war's ennobling qualities the period since the war resembles in a general way the period before and during the war there are films like the big parade and even all quiet on the western front which explicitly condemn war but implicitly by their nostalgic tone their uncritical non-incisive pacifism their placing of the blame on the lesser individual and the stay at home their sympathy with the protagonist their excitement their comic interludes make war interesting their little condemnations are lost amid the overwhelming pile of films in which war is a farcical holiday or a swashbuckler's adventure the momentary pointing of guilt is made so naive so passing that it never gets across to the audience the case of sergeant grisha and hell's angels it simply serves as a betrayal supporting the bluff of disarmament conferences Carl Limley was suggested for the Nobel Peace Prize for All Quiet. During the war, he made the Kaiser Beast of Berlin. After the war, he wept upon the plight of his Vaterland in his advertising column in the Saturday Evening Post. And after All Quiet, he issued a series of sergeant private girl farces in which one of his agonized germans of all quiet is starred well he still qualifies for the prize he is no less noble than wilson or gray we have also governmental cooperation the navy however has declined to cooperate in films kidding officers it's all right to make fools of gobs, but it's bad business to invite gobs to laugh at the officers. The class distinction is important in the capitalist army, more and more important today. Further cooperation between producers and military is found in the Warner Brothers instruction in sound to officers. The battleships are being sound equipped how easily the movie can be put on a war basis and of course we still have the films glorifying individual branches of the service from driving to aviation film producers and impresarios carry honorary military titles let us not be led astray by objections to pacifist films like all quiet and hell's angels 
The neurosis of national honor is today so active in capitalist countries that the slightest abrasion set it off. The fascist Germans find in these films insults to German officers. The fascist French accept them for the same reason. In the meantime, Germany issues a film like The German Mother Heart, in which a mother who has lost six sons is made to feel how exceptional was her opportunity. In America, a similar theme is handled in Four Sons, and with it all we have educational films flaunting patriotism. RKO has a patriotic week that is praised by Vice President Curtis. The total is rather threatening. Only the workers' movement is a potent factor against imperialist war. Imperialist war is completely indicted in the films of the USSR alone. The Soviet kino selects images at once real and symbolic that concentrate the horrors of war and relate war to its source. Andreas Letzko, in his book Men in War, created a picture of war whose images are at once real symbolic and relentless no film producer has proven his sincere condemnation of war by filming this book capitalism wants its pacifism delectable the soviet kino goes beyond latsko it sets war directly within the society producing it a film developed entirely to war can do nothing else but make of war an ominous, therefore compelling, universe. The Soviet film makes war a portion of the film, the hideous peak of a competitive society. Footnote. The best example is Boris Barnett's The Patriots. Released in America by Am Kino in 1933. See also Note by Irving Lerner in New Masses, August 1933, page 27. End footnote. The movie is valuable as a merchandise in itself, to sell other merchandise as a vehicle for the national idea, and as an instrument of imperialist control. In an editorial quoted at the beginning of this pamphlet, in the November 4th issue of the London Country Life, 1911, we are told, quote, some recent events in Canada have caused many of us to consider more seriously than heretofore the purposes to which the cinematograph can be used the business in moving pictures was practically monopolized by two American firms, and they, moved no doubt only by pecuniary motives, followed the practice which has long been that of our cousins of twisting the lion's tail. The particular twisting which appeared to find favor in the United States consisted in showing an American soldier in the performance of deeds of unheard of gallantry, and a British soldier in an attitude correspondingly contemptible. This might very well pass as an amusement in some of the more remote and less enlightened hounds of the United States. It does not concern us much here, because there has always been a considerable amount of raillery passed between John Bull and Uncle Sam. But a very different situation arose when those exhibitions were carried into one of the most important overseas dominions of the king. End quote. England doesn't care what America thinks of her, but she's worried about what her colonies may think. However, in dealing with another power, diplomatic care must be taken. Therefore, the Overseas Club handled the matter without, of course, 
criticizing, quote, the taste of the American manufacturer and pandering to the anti-British element in the United States, end quote. The Ottawa branch met and protested strongly against the exhibition of too many motion pictures. Does this imply that a limited number were acceptable? Quote, showing deeds of valor performed by the Americans to the detriment of views exhibiting the glory of the British people. End quote. British war pictures were substituted in Canada. The New York press called the Canadian sentiment anti-American. Today, 20 years later, when the nationalist temper is hot and bothered, Oh, what a lot of rancor in Ottawa. Some 15 years after that pre-war strife, the same sentiment was expressed with scurrility by the British press, which saw before it the enormity of the American movie. A fascist journal, The Patriot, wrote on American film propaganda, quote, we hope, but do not expect, that the agitation over British films will arouse English people to the danger in their midst of American propaganda through the agency of American films. England is being suffocated by American films. They lead in East and West. The historical films have for their motive the belittling of the monarchy as an institution. End quote. <laughs> Come now. J.W. Drawbell, editor of the London Sunday Chronicle, said, quote, We are suffering from too much America. End quote. But he added, quote, we are fools if we delude ourselves that we have nothing to learn from these same people at whom we rather look down our noses. End quote. The Prince of Wales was called upon to urge an empire movie for England. The imperialistic motivation is easily read between the lines of Premier MacDonald to the House of Commons in 1927. Quote, there is one serious reason why every one of us is interested in British films being shown abroad, and that is that British film should uphold to foreign nations a better conception of the moral conduct and social habits of people who profess to belong to the leading nations of the world. Then, unfortunately, is the case with so many films that are being exported, for instance, to China. These people who, a few years ago, regarded us as being a dominant and ruling people. End quote. The Labour Party premier is worried about British financial prestige in the Far East. Two years previously, the Tory Baldwin had showed himself in accord with the premier to follow when he said to Parliament, quote, I think the time has come when the position of the film industry in this country should be examined to see if it is not possible as it is desirable on national grounds, having regard to the enormous power which the film has developed for propaganda purposes, and the danger to which we in this country and our empire subject ourselves, if we allow that method of propaganda to be in the hands of foreign countries. End quote. Mr. Baldwin is less ambiguous than his successor. England is most disturbed about the influence of the film in South Africa, where white hegemony is threatened by the increasing cohesion between black and white workers. Therefore, the censorship is very severe in regard to the possible effect of films on the natives. Anathema are, quote, 
all subjects which are calculated to wound the susceptibilities of foreign people and especially of our subjects of the british empire End quote. these are political anathema political hypocrisy among the social are stories showing any quote, antagonistic or strained relations between white men and the colored population of the british empire especially with regard to the question of sexual intercourse moral or immoral between individuals of different races End quote. the divisions of the censor's code dovetail under military we discover that the movie may not show quote, Officers in the British uniform in a disgraceful light. Conflicts between the armed forces of a state and the populace. Reflections on wife of responsible British official in the East. End quote. These are quoted from specific restrictions. In 1928, films were censored on political grounds of, quote, references to h r h the prince of wales libelous reflections on royal dynasties british possessions represented as lawless sinks of iniquity white men in state of degradation amidst far eastern and native surroundings End quote. and always this reiteration quote, equivocal situations between white girls and men of other races End quote. how about white men and girls of other races was not a scene deleted from piccadilly where the british star jameson thomas kisses the chinese american actress anna may wong under administration of justice we find that no film coming into Britain or born in Britain may show police firing on defenseless populace. That, of course, has never happened in the magnanimous British Empire. Lately, the British press has been feverish in the demand for even closer censorship of films for South Africa. It protests, quote, deplorable impression of the morality of the white man and worse still of the white woman end quote, which american films convey quote, the establishment of a board in london to censor all films for exhibition in tropical africa will readily commend itself to all those who have the best interests of the native races at heart as well as the prestige of the Europeans. The silly tosh on American films does materially help to lower the prestige of the white man in the eyes of the unsophisticated native. The increase in crime out here is, in many instances, due to the film. And anything that in any way decreases the prestige of white women in a black country is an abomination which should be firmly put down End quote. yet the british film sees nothing deplorable in picturing an asian resistance to british invasion as an act of a dirty dog in the lost patrol england may reply that it is competing with the american movie which purchased a british novel beau geste and put it under the direction of an Englishman, Herbert Brennan, to be made into a movie glorifying three Britishers in the Foreign Legion against the Arabs. Incidentally, a Frenchman is portrayed in the film as a rat. France protests and prohibits the film. USA produces a sequel, Beau Sabre in which the rat is not only a Frenchman, but a rebel, too. To assuage France, Hollywood then issues Forgotten Faces, wherein the Americanization of Frenchmen, Froggy, B. 
becomes for French circulation broggy. But the type, a crook, is a French stereotype of American idiom. What does Will Hayes say about respect for the citizens of other countries? England applauds British filmmaking in India as long as the makers are upper caste Indians waiting on British approval and the film's obsolete and meaningless legends about Indian princes. Under various other guises, imperialism is supported, defended, vindicated, honored. England films Sir Alan Cobham's aeroplane tour of Africa. The white man's burden becomes lighter in the air, especially when the burden itself is kitted. France films the automobile expedition of the Henry Ford of France, André Citron. The trek is recorded through the black heart in dances by the natives, but never are we permitted an insight into the imperialistic nature of this expedition and its meaning to these black dancers. America issues boastful hunt films in which the Negro is a coward and a lazy wretch. These films have become such a formula that they are patched up in studios from fragments and shots taken in zoological gardens. In such a film, Africa Speaks, the perpetrators dare to stage the slaughter of a Negro boy by a lion and to mourn the death hypocritically. It is obviously a fake, but that a Negro and not a white man is chosen as the victim is itself significant. The two false explorers are most offensive in their enacted authority toward the Negro, whom they would never dare to treat so in the open veldt. Their conduct is a commentary on the white man's Negro. Lions roar, and the white men boldly face the beasts with their cameras. The Negroes dive into a cave and hide. The goateed white men remark upon a Negro, quote, He is tired, L-A-Z-Y tired, end quote. Will Hayes threatened to expose the bogusness of this film. The Columbia Company, its distributors, joined the Hayes organization. The film is still circulating. If it isn't contempt the chauvinistic film heaps upon the Negro, then it is patronage, the faithful slave, as in Trader Horn. The evasion of the human subject matter in the films of colonial and semi-colonial peoples typifies most American pictures of that kind. We have a film around monkeys, Rango, or a film in which the native is an isolated unit, Chang, or a film in which the natives are forgotten people, Grass, or a film of a remote and unimportant legend in which the imperialistic suggestion is safe in the background, taboo, or lyrical studies of a ceremony like Moena in white shadows in the South Seas. The struggle is platitudinously, abstractly, stated as between civilization and romance and concretely as between a gang of thugs and a derelict doctor, romantically inclined. Never is this struggle depicted as the advance of imperialism, and never is the conclusion more than a wistful shrug of the shoulders. It's very, very sad, but nothing can be done about it. In reference to the Indian, since the tale is retrospective, we may see the film lamenting the vanished Indian. This is the gallantry that slays and then forgives. 
or it may idealize the lost paradise as in the silent enemy or vindicate the white man by having the hero or the hero's son marrying the chief's daughter never of course the lowly indian girl this occurs in cimarron where the hero murmurs distantly about the one dollar and forty cents paid the indian for his land and the wife talks about the dirty indians and the son marries the indian hired girl who i'll have you know is no humble menial but an osage chief's daughter by 1930, the marriage becomes respectable, even elite. And there are the innumerable films in which the red man is a vicious murderer or a sneak. If he is a half-breed, well, of course, he's got to be a sneak. Cimarron has such a character. From the heights of his superiority, the white exploiter may condescend to see the red man as a loyal person <laughs> loyal that is to the white gentile happy to be the white man's burden along with the negro and the jew it is interesting that in this one film cimarron the devoted osage the loyal negro who dies in his loyalty the soulful jew whose soul grows from a peddler's wagon into a department store, are assembled for the entertainment and education of the audience. In this way, the imperialist, the oppressor, is complimented, and his imperialism is redeemed and glorified. Other tactics are used to the aid of the machinery of whitewashing and covering up the deeds of the imperialists. In the last few years, the screen has abounded with films glorifying American aggression. Old Ironsides dealt with the War of Tripoli. The Rough Riders makes an idol of the Spanish-American War, and Flight says sweet things about our Nicaraguan occupation nationalistic self-glory to the disadvantage of the oppressed fills the screens of the capitalist world italy anticipated the fascist march on rome with pictures glorifying the roman past cabiria quo vadis theodora etc since the fascist coup italy has been producing films sentimentalizing her imperialist aspirations and the love of an arab for an italian and of an italian for an arab footnote one has only to follow the news of the german film industry since hitler came into power for further confirmation of this fact for some time before hitler's regime the government turned out pro-fascist and imperialist films Two of them were distributed here, The Rebel and Morgenrot, the former a fake historical film preaching Nazi nationalism with the help of Christianity against France. Universal Pictures Corps, Jewish owned and Jewish managed by father and son, Lamley, are the distributors and they are now making a film in America for the Nazis. Morgenrot was distributed by an independent firm. End footnote. Only one society dares to issue films exposing imperialism. That society is the land of the Soviets. A Shanghai document, China Express, Storm over Asia, Love in the Caucasus, Salt of Swanesia, and other films depict the suppression of autonomy, the aggression in the Orient, the contrasts in life between colonial or semi-colonial and the imperialist, between poor colonial and rich. 
Similarly, the Soviet films are the only ones which expose the imperialistic motive of war. The land of this cinema is the present target of the imperialists. When the Russian monarchy was destroyed, the event was seized upon by demagogues as a proof of the slogan that the war was being fought to, quote, make the world safe for democracy, end quote. But at the same time, Russia's defection was threatening. Brennan, who made the feminist pacifist war brides before the war and was to make the pacifist the case of Sergeant Grisha, after the war, directed the last of the Romanovs, where Rasputin is the villain, the Tsar a duped innocent, and the pogromshik of Saritsyn, now Stalingrad, the mad monk Iliador in person, is the hero, the savior of Russia. The film was directed against the Kaiser, <laughs> the Rasputin of Europe, and the Bolsheviks. It was meant as a discouragement of the revolution. Anton the Terrible, a Lasky crime, admitted the guilt of the Tsarist officer, who apologizes for his cruelty, and it condemned the revolutionary. In the years before the war, America had issued films sympathizing with the revolutionary, usually a Jew. An effort was made to reconcile the persecuted with the persecutor, in morganatic marriages or in the sudden ennoblement of the tyrant. The solution of the discord was carried very emphatically into the film that echoed the February Revolution and the threat of October. With this propaganda at work, America, though an official bureau, let it be known that, quote, the American economic mission in Russia will use the motion pictures for the advanced work of enlightening the uninformed people of the most remote parts as well as Russians in general who have been entirely misled by German propaganda. Because of the existing conditions in Russia, and in effect of German propaganda, no amount of printed matter could possibly accomplish so much as the widespread showing of motion pictures. Films will open the way for effective later use of printed matter. For the great Russian film campaign, the motion picture companies have called upon for 40 miles of film, providing not only the directly educational and news films which show America's war activities, troops in France and the German devastation of Belgium, but also a certain proportion of typical American screen dramas. If Ivan laughs at Charlie Chaplin and falls in love with Mary Pickford, he comes appreciably nearer to reaching a receptive state of mind for the subsequent work of the American mission. End quote. End of section three. Section 4 of The Eyes of the Movie by Harry Allen Potamkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anti-Soviet Propaganda Footnote Recently there has been another cycle of anti-Soviet films. Clear All Wires and Rasputin and The Empress. Both directed by Richard Boleslavsky the Polish White Guardist. Other films have been Scarlet Dawn and Forgotten Commandments. End footnote. Since the war, suggestive films have been issued in which the attempt is made to influence the mind of the audience against Soviet Russia. 
by idealizing and romanticizing czarist days the court the love of an aristocrat for a girl of the people etc other films like the last command glorify a nobleman the grand duke and by contrast degrade the revolutionary in the last command a train carrying the revolutionists collapses through a bridge i shall not go so far to say that this is intended as a symbolic prophecy of the collapse of the soviet union but it certainly excites an emotion prejudicial to it every land has been guilty of heinous film propaganda against soviet russia the fox company of america which had recently gone thumbs down on all newsreel clips showing unemployment lines and all that might even remotely be construed as bolshevist propaganda has recently issued a film called the spy which hollows the grand duke and invites the assassination of the soviet official this film has had diligent circulation to family audiences it relates to the emigres in paris cheka spies listen in the grand duke never once visible to the audience becomes more awesome by speaking and revealing his physical presence only with his arm and hand this is a theatrical trick that was used in ben hur to deify christ someone must go to moscow to assassinate citizen x the leader of the cheka who we are told won't let the emigres families leave the ussr the sympathy is all with the emigres who for no fault of their own are being persecuted the noble young captain whose wife and child are in russia risks his life to do the deed which ain't according to fox so dirty a cheka spy trails him he beats the spy off nobility just oozes out of the pores of this movie the nobility of the invisible grand duke the captain the wife the son the best prisorni these last the homeless waifs are presented so as to suggest they are still rampant in russia when as a matter of fact the soviets have heroically solved their problem in the film the soviet police pursue the waifs several fall to death from the housetops anything to increase the horror of the soviet regime so noble in contrast is aristocracy that the captain's wife willingly becomes the hostess in a state gambling house because the money from the den goes to succor the waifs with whom her child lived while she was purposely falsely imprisoned you see one of the aristocrats is now a traitor to his class the cheka uses him to trap the captain because they know he loves the captain's wife and when he wants to do her further dirt the waifs kill him they love aristocrats so how noble are the enemies of the soviet union how ignoble are the friends the film was made about the time soviet russia nipped the intervention plot of the industrial party about the time Dinikin's history appeared in English, wherein the interventionist of 1920 avows the emigres have not yet yielded their ideals. The immediate motivation behind the picture is explained by the identities of the members of the Fox Directorial Board. They include the President of the Utilities Power and Light Corps, Chairman of the Governing Committee, of the chase national bank the son-in-law of andy mellon who is at the same time a director of the up railroad corny vanderbilt 
the prexy of the Central Trust Co. of Illinois, other bankers, industrialists, etc. The interlocking of control means a unity of purpose, and the imminent purpose is war against the Soviet Union. Every reactionary agency and institution in our society has its hand or wants its hand in the movie. The Daughters of the American Revolution has a committee for better films. The national chairman, in her annual report, 1928, said, quote, I am sure that everyone present will agree with me that the motion picture today holds what is probably the greatest power for good or evil in the world. And I am sure that you agree also that it is up to you and to me and to our prototypes among the 116 million citizens which influence shall predominate. End quote. Under the hypocritical guise of better films, the influence that shall predominate is apparent enough. The influence is to be borne by patriotic films of state and national history with the emphasis on a George Washington picture. The DAR cooperates with the Hayes Organization in the interests of this patriotic service to glorify the incidents and personages of American history, from the Battle of Saratoga to the imperialistic flights of Colonel Lindbergh. Among the ten films favored by the chairman of the committee are four films sentimentalizing military training, Mother's Sacrifice in War, Jingoism generally. Two are of a religious nature. One romanticizes the subjugation of the American Indian, and one is anti-Soviet. The DAR advertises itself in patriotic trailers, taking three minutes for showing. The first of these reveals, quote, our flag waving in the breeze, with a boy and a girl, either scouts or members of the children of the American Revolution, properly saluting the flag and pledging allegiance to it using the uniform flag salute adopted by the DRA and 67 other patriotic organizations. End quote. We find the DRA poking into other civilian bodies like the National Board of Review and the Amateur Cinema League, whose executive director sports the title of Colonel the various state chapters boast of having shown patriotic films on such occasions as George Washington's birthday anniversary, waving the flag ostentatiously. In the chairman's report, care is taken to refer to the help the motion picture industry has given to the Red Cross and to mention the Church and Drama Association, recently deceased, and the Religious Motion Picture Foundation. The former organization had the chairman at one of its luncheons as a guest of honor. The church has been thirsty and hungry for the movie. It has found the film edging in on its province as distraction and ritual, and has brought pressure to the industry and government in an attempt to control the art of the lowly, finding that it could not dispose of so powerful a folk pleasure by calling it a menace, and very early discovering how this medium could serve clerical propaganda, it went into the arena in two ways. First, it has sought to produce films, not too successfully, we have read above of the early missionary films. One of the first pictures made was of the Passion. This was duped and repeated over and over again. One may find ads today for such pictures in trade journals like The Billboard. 
In 1925, the Religious Motion Picture Foundation was organized under the auspices of the Harmon Foundation. Its offices are, appropriately, in the financial district of New York, Nassau Street. As to the productions of this foundation, we read, quote, All controversial or debatable grounds have been avoided, and the subject matter of all films has been confined to simple and well-recognized interpretations that have governed Christianity through the centuries. End quote. The foundation wants the church to compete effectively, quote, with the drawing power of golf course beach and motor, end quote, not only to lure, quote, the young people of today and many of the older ones, end quote, away from the movies and dance halls, of course, quote, if you are able to draw large crowds away, you are to be congratulated, end quote, but to give them at the same time, quote, a living and inspiring religion, end quote. The church was losing its grip over young people. On March 20th, 1914, Canon Chase appeared before the Committee on Education of the House of Representatives and opposed the unofficial Board of Censors, now National Board of Review. Chase has been very zealous for a national censorship that would make it simpler for the church, his church, to control the film. For some time, he issued in the joint name of the New York Civic League and the Lord's Day Alliance, his catechism on motion pictures and interstate commerce. Today, he is general secretary on the Federal Motion Picture Council, which wants a government commission to control the movie. Similarly, the Women's Christian Temperance Union endorses the Hudson Bill which, amid the usual decoys of moral supervision, places the real aim of capitalist control, the suppression of films that, quote, ridicule or deprecate public officials or other governmental authority, or which tend to weaken the authority of the law, which offend the religious belief of any person or ridicule recognized leaders or symbols of any religious sect, which unduly emphasize bloodshed and violence. This is obviously class legislation and really nationalizes the Hayes Code. The question is solely as to which reactionary agency shall directly benefit from the profits of control. Our fight against national censorship must be solely one to prevent further suppression of films made by possible courageous independent, by labor or by the Soviet studios. We know that the censors of Pennsylvania suppressed the armored cruiser Potemkin, and that Seeds of Freedom was emasculated beyond any possible showing. Since the latter film revealed the synagogue's betrayal of young Jews in the 1905 revolution, Jews of Philadelphia society refused to pull strings for its freedom from gross destruction. We know that while Hayes wants to keep national censorship off and control in his own hand, he was not averse to, in fact, induced, the suppression of the Sacco Vanzetti newsreels and those of the March 6th, 1930 unemployment demonstration in New York. We know that on that day, the police commissioner requested the cameo, a house belonging to RKO of the Hayes organization, to remove the Soviet film China Express, which had another week to run. The cameo complied immediately with this request. 
we know also that various excuses are used in the suppression of a film of challenge. The British Board of Censors prohibited Potemkin because, quote, it deals with recent controversial matters, end quote. Local bodies like the London County Council and the Middlesex County Council refuse to pass it. When the agent tries to put it through other local councils, quote, he suddenly receives a visit, the first of several, from officers of the Special Department of Scotland Yard, end quote. The agent wants no quarrels with government inspectors. He makes no further effort to show the film and is even scared to let a parliament committee look at it. The Podovkin picture mother was not allowed, quote, on the ground that its scene was Russia, that its action concerned a strike, and that forces of order were depicted firing on a mob. Reply by the agent that many films of American and other origin, dealing with the Russian Revolution or the events preceding it, often in a manner unsympathetic to authority, had been approved. The Red Dancer of Moscow and the Volga Boatman, as well as other films like Intolerance and The Three Passions, showing the shooting of a mob. The exception taken was then altered and explained to cover rather the tenor of depiction of scene and action than the scene and action themselves. End quote. We need not go with this argument. This was a Soviet film. That was enough. Always does capitalism object, so it says, to the controversial. That's what Fox said when it ordered unemployment and Bolshevism out of its newsreels. Footnote. But it could launch a malicious attack on communism and communists in a Fox film called Shanghai Madness. End footnote. It's said that a mixed reception to Mussolini provoked the thumbs down on controversial matter. But right after the order, Benito was on the Fox screens and Fox was exploiting the spy. France, most fearful of the nations when Soviet Russia is mentioned, has suppressed the Spartacus Film League, which exhibited Soviet pictures, and prohibited the best of these films, mutilating others and permitting those most negligible in persuasiveness or political theme. The English soldiers in Stormy Over Asia were vaguely called whites. In the meantime, French capital is invested in the movies of the bluffer buffer states of Poland, Romania, and Czechoslovakia. And these pictures, jingoistic and most often wretched, are shown in Paris to exaggerated praise of the press. The stool pigeon must be petted. It serves in the anti-Soviet attack. The poor exhibitor, having a bad Polish film forced on him, is frequently obliged to lure his patrons by calling it a Russian film. At the same time, the fascist youth of Le Camelot's du Roy attack the Golden Age, the film of a young Spanish aesthete. The reasons assemble so. Bunuel, the director, is one of the super-realists, a friend of artists who have been communists. His picture, hardly direct, seems to make fun of the clergy. And there's a small man with a tall wife. He is mocking the king of Italy. That's how acute national honor is. In Nuremberg, the beautiful picture, The Beggar's Opera, a film far from drastic in its satire, is suppressed because it broadly kids the clergy and the police. 
the clergy is very sensitive you know hayes had to say don't laugh at a minister in the films he even called in the sex to act in coalition with him he has been especially close to the catholics even though he himself is a presbyterian elder the catholics are internationally unified they have their movie congress and they can use the sacred weapon of excommunication in nineteen sixteen they placed a ban on power of the cross a m kennedy its author and producer was threatened with excommunication if he showed the picture today hayes has on his committee on public relations the national catholic welfare conference and the international federation of catholic alumni as well as the dar the boy scouts the general federation of women's clubs the russell sage foundation the national congress of parents and teachers the national education association the american library association the young men's christian association and the national recreation association schools church playground club etc quote less actively associated were representatives of various religious organizations including the federal council of churches End quote which recently had a skirmish with Hayes. It wants to be heard more. Quote, Labor organizations, patriotic societies, and health, civic, and welfare bodies. End quote. When the coalition was started, labor was represented by the AF of L demagogue, Hugh Frame lately included by matthew wall in his one hundred citizens to combat communism but the a f of l is perfectly content to let hayes do the job of making the worker a quote one hundred percent american end quote it subscribes to hayes's address to german movie men in berlin in the summer of nineteen thirty to veto all films containing quote, social political or economic ideas end quote. this was a suggested attack on soviet films and only ones whose quote, social political or economic ideas might consistently offend Hayes or Hugenberg, the fascist owner of the German UFA, with whom Hayes was so convivial. The attack is also directed against any ideas critical of the status quo that might even moderately be present in a film made outside of the Soviet Union. Hayes has admitted that the movie is quote, capable of wielding a subtle and powerful influence upon ideas, end quote. So do the proponents of national censorship. These include the Federal Motion Picture Council, launched in 1925. Quote, its first president was the general director of the department of moral welfare of the presbyterian church in the u s a in this council we find quote, the national motion picture chairman of the u c t u previously in the department of moral welfare end quote, of the presbyterian church and another member quote, general secretary of the women's cooperative alliance of minneapolis end quote, as well as church rectors other bodies favoring national censorship are the disciples of christ the woman's foreign missionary society of the methodist episcopal church the women's missionary council of the m e church south the north american home missions congress the Northern Baptist Convention, and the notorious National Grange. 
All these are thundering on the right. We on the left must build both defense and offense to their reaction. The answer lies with the audience of the movie, which D. W. Griffith called the laboring man's university. The movie magnates are looking for a new audience. They cannot see that the new audience is the old audience with a new mind, a mind in advance of the reviewers and the producers. This audience can be directed to see the fraudulence of reactionary films, showing the Soviet pictures and other revolutionary films are themselves arguments against the shallowness of the American film, which has only prejudice as its basis. The film and the photo leagues, the John Reed clubs, and other workers' cultural organizations through revolutionary film criticism and through their own revolutionary films must instruct the film audience in the detection of treacherous reaction of the bourgeois film. We must build, on the left, the movie. End of section four. End of the Eyes of the Movie by Harry Allen Potemkin Read by Chuck Williamson